Did you True. like how I wrote to you in makeshift Italian to try yes. <laughs> to get you on my podcast? Was that actual? Yes. Was it? Was it even? Could you well, even? How did you manage it? to do that? What, what was it like? You know that it was like some sort of Esperanto that you know, like uh, that you put together. Yes. I'm just- Yes, no, I I Google Translate it, and yeah, I then I got my assistant, who is Italian, to look it over, and she said mm-hmm. that it seemed quasi okay, and so okay, I sent good. it off. And then last night, when I was perusing your Instagram, I saw you made a made up character who was like uber Italian, with eating yeah. pasta all the time, and I was like, oh my god, I've I've yeah. I've done the unthinkable. I've made him out into uh, the I, Italian doctor. I did this interview with the, the Pazzinis a few days ago, and they're like a couple, and you know, he's Italian and she's American, and they they have this like thing where like, you know, he he tries the pasta, whatever, and and, and he's like, Oh, it's overcooked, not good. That, that's not how we do it in Italy. It's very good, actually. They have like millions of followers, actually, and they're wonderful people. And unfortunately they have endometriosis and so like we were talking about their experience but yeah that's where i got the idea basically honestly i saw that you also suggested that people have pasta al dente because it would have a lowered amount of gluten Mm -hmm. and it would be better for them do you have any idea how many people that i've told to not eat pasta who are now going to just have al dente pasta (laughs) But honestly, do we really do we really want people not to eat any gluten at all? I mean, I'm not. I'm. I'm just kind of saying this in a provocative, you know, just to stimulate thought. Because I'm. I'm thinking: Do these diets, which are so restrictive, really benefit people? Is it really an option, an ongoing option for people's life to have these elimination diets where they don't eat anything, basically? I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. It's possible that, you know, there could be a temporary benefit, but I just don't see how somebody can go through life never eating gluten, never eating dairy, never eating this, never eating that. It just seems very hard. No, I agree. I I, I typically tell my patients that they should try to enjoy their life because life begets life. Um, mm-hmm. So I give sort of like an 80-20 You know, in in terms of having grains, having dairy versus Mm -hmm. not, Um, Mm -hmm. and just use like a paleo diet as a basic framework for reducing Mm -hmm. inflammation and increasing protein, because it's an easier way to get people to eat more vegetables, more protein, as opposed Mm -hmm. to, I don't ever say gluten-free though, because I hate corn. So, right. and most gluten-free options are then made from corn, which is more inflammatory. But anyway, mm-hmm. I want to get into the nitty-gritty mm-hmm. of your stance on unexplained infertility and what you see in terms of patients coming to you. Are you getting a lot of, do you do a lot of second opinions? Um do people come primarily to see you, like to to start their journey? I do. You know, one thing that you may or may not know about me is that I, I used to have, I used to run an IVF center. I had an IVF center, which I opened, uh, you know, in the end of, at the end of the nineties, and um, I ran it for you know a little bit over a decade, you know, maybe a little bit longer, and uh, so. I had extensive experience in IVF, and uh, so and after that, I got tired of running a center, just the business of running a center. So I sold it, and uh, and I uh, dedicated myself more to recurrent pregnancy loss, like infertility, but with a focus on recurrent pregnancy loss immunology, and uh, you know that has been the focus. So. Um, right now, I see my role whenever I see people more like as an advisor uh, on their pro- on their reproductive problem than as uh, really a, a fertility specialist, if you will, because I don't really offer the treatment. I don't really offer the the IVF in my practice. 
which in a way is a good thing because I think, you know, I'm not selling it, right? So at least I can speak without any sort of like thoughts that people would think, oh, you just want me to do IVF because that's what you do, you know? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and obviously because the IVF world today has changed significantly, I was talking today with a friend who is an embryologist at a very big IVF center, one of the most famous in New York and probably in the world. And, uh, you know, in this place, they do 22 retrievals a day, 22. So, you know, it's in many IVF centers, they do 20, 30, 40 retrievals a day. So, you know, with those kind of volumes, you don't even know who's who. You don't even know who the embryos are. You you don't know anything. You're just going through the motions as a very high technology uh, processing center, you know, like so. Fertility management is really high tech today and really brute force. So you come in, you know, why even bother to find out what the cause of infertility is? I mean, yeah, you want to make sure there's sperm. You want to check the ovarian reserve because, you know, you want to make sure that there's eggs and it's a very good predictor. You know, make sure the thyroid is okay, the basics, and that's it. And then you're doing IVF. I mean, some people have to do IUIs because... Their insurance requires it, their insurance company, you know? Right. Like uh, that you have to do really, three IUIs before you do IVF? Yeah. I think it's the same thing in Canada. You have to go through, you know, jump a few hoops. Right. And then that's it, IVF, you know? So um, it's really like a technological thing where, you know, these uh, IVF centers are high tech centers, mm-hmm. and that's it. So the question is, what happens to the people who are not successful, really? You know, that's really the, the problem. And what happens to the people who are like, well, maybe I don't want to do IVF right off the bat. And uh, I want to do something else. I want to try on my own. And and so th- I think that's the kind of situation where uh, people cannot find answers because the answers are not provided. You know, there people do not. Um, you know, doctors, especially in IVF center, they're like, if you don't want to do IVF, why, why are you here? You know? Right. Uh, and so I think that, you know, and your question comes from that, you know, what do I do? I mean, usually I see people who are, have already gone through the system. They've been already put through the meat grinder. Right. And, uh, um, have not succeeded, and now they come here. You know, because usually when people are naive about uh, the process of fertility or IVF, they they don't really, they don't know. They don't even know who to see. So people end up seeing me only after they've done their research. You know, they start looking and trying to find answers. I think that's really what happens. And I think uh, um, it's not an uncommon situation because you have to remember that only about half people of people who do IVF get pregnant. So, you know, you got a half of them who don't get pregnant. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, and, and, you know, the numbers go up the longer you try, but people do not have either the money or the ener- mental energy or the physical energy to actually keep on doing IVF endlessly. Yeah. And that's just the reality of where things are. And I'm sure that you, the people that you see are in the, in the same. So IUIs, for example, um, Mm -hmm. and they are just put straight to IVF based on an unexplained diagnosis. What Mm -hmm. happens is they, when IVF doesn't work, they now are thinking to themselves, well, I've done, I brought out the big guns and those didn't work. So now I must really be in trouble. Like ma- now I must really be infertile as opposed to looking at infertility as a puzzle and understanding the pieces that are there and trying to order them in a way that results in pregnancy. Um, and so much of the time, there's a few good centers here Um where they do immunology testing, but there's so many that, that don't. They, they have a, the, the blanket statement of, I don't believe in reproductive immunology, which 
I, I struggle with, um, not because I necessarily understand the basics of reproductive immunology, but because anecdotally, the number of patients that I see where there's nothing wrong in terms of like we have clear tubes, there's good reserve, sperm is good, no DNA frag, um, no polyps, lining looks great there's got to be an explanation. And then when I've sent them to see um, an REI who looks deeper into, mm -hmm. you know, clotting into the immune system, then they do like experimental treatments that result in them becoming pregnant almost to the point where they're shocked. Like the patients, the patients feel like that was too easy. I've, I did all mm -hmm. of this IVF, um, I've done all the vitamins. I've done all of everything for years. This has been my whole life. And now that I'm there, I, there's no way that that, you know, blood thinner could be what resulted in pregnancy. There's no way that that lit treatment was, that was too easy. It was like an allergy test. And mm -hmm. I struggle to like help them understand, you know, getting pregnant doesn't have to be this uphill battle. Like I understand that it feels that way for you now, but that's because you were given the wrong solution because no one really understood the problem. So I-, I It's one of the problems that you have in medicine uh, or in, in most fields of human knowledge, which you have to deal with the individual biases. You know, they can be cultural biases. They can be um, you know, all, there's all types of different biases, but what happens is that uh, people selectively pick and choose whatever um, whatever um, evidence they feel is the evidence that fits their scientific vision, medical vision, world vision, and based on that, they make their own determinations. So, right, you have this. Uh, what I call selective uh, demand for scientific rigor, which is for the stuff that we like, then, you know, that's what we do. But for the stuff that we don't like, we demand the most sophisticated, you know, studies and all that stuff, right? Yeah. So, you know, they do lots of stuff that is... Um, in in all IVF centers, but in general in medicine, doctors do lots of stuff that is not proven. It's just because they that's the way they do stuff. Yeah. But then when when it comes to stuff that they don't like, they're like, no, no, wait a second. Where are the studies? Show me the papers. You know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, and you know, like I said, I call it selective demand for scientific rigor. And uh, and I think you've seen that. You know, obviously, even in the field of of. Uh, you know, sort of a holistic approach in medicine, whether it's acupuncture or whether it's nutritional approaches, you see the same thing, right? Where they're like, oh, you know, uh, sort of this paternalistic approach where like, if you want to do it, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's it's not going to help you. You know, there's no studies or something like that. So, yeah, I think uh, that's what we deal with. And, um, you know, I felt a lot of this resistance over the years. And, you know, obviously, it's not like everything is immunology. I mean, it's not like the, it's only the answer is only in the immune system. I mean, the answer may be in the immune system, and it's worth taking a look. The mm -hmm. answer may be endometriosis, as it's worth taking a look. So um, you're just keeping an open mind and trying to figure out the answers. And, uh, you know, um, and then ultimately, once you have the information, you can make your decision. Um, that's really how I feel when it comes to, to this type of process. I don't, I'm not um, ideological about it. Not at all. I mean, I'm very open-minded in fact. Yeah. I think, but that's, that's why I'm such a fan because you are, you're so flexible. Um, and the, I was, there's, you know, a field of doctors in Toronto specifically that I deal with um, mostly. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, different patients would fit best with different doctors. But what I mm -hmm. do find really interesting is patients will ask, well, who do you think I should see? And my answer is always the same. The person who's going to be the most flexible in finding out your problem. Mm -hmm. And right. anyone who's like, this is the way, this is the way. 
it's so interesting. How can anything be just absolute um, when you're dealing with humans where everything is constantly in flux? And it like one specific example is the, you know, for example, the ERA and how it mm -hmm. was used. So um, w without, you know, even looking at necessarily a patient's history, everybody was doing the ERA before a transfer. And then they found that, I think it was something along the lines of the, the patent ran out. And mm -hmm. a study came out that found that the ERA was actually not that helpful, um, which was something well, anecdotally. It's not, it's, not, it's not really exactly like that. You okay. Know? okay. Um, I mean, partially like that. But, you know, I think the ERA, the goal of the ERA was to try to figure out if it was a timing issue, right? You know, Progesterone the embryo transfer, window. which made some sense, but not like a hundred percent of sense because one has to imagine that nature has built a system by which the sperm, sorry, the fertilized embryo enters the endometrium and there has to be a wide window of implantation. Yeah. You know, because otherwise nobody would ever get pregnant if you have to if you have to measure it by the hour, if not the minute. Right. So this idea that it would have to be an exact hour by which it, when the embryo has to implant is really biologically not plausible. Right. Having said that, you know, the RA, you know, was focused on that goal and, you know, the science was pretty solid on how they designed it. And uh, uh, ultimately, um, it became extremely popular, mostly because people demanded it. So it's not like, I don't think the doctors were pushing the RA. I think the doctors uh, felt uh, compelled to order a test because the, the patients asked for the test. Right. And uh, especially when they would not get pregnant after the first transfer, you know, and especially if the PGT normal embryos, the patient would come back and say, hey, wait a second. Is there anything else that we can do? Any other test? So mm -hmm. doing the ERA seemed like an easy thing to do, number one, because, you know, uh, it's easy to do. You just do a, a, mock, a, a mock cycle and you do the biopsy. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that, you know, you're keeping the patient. In fact, you're doing one more cycle that you have to be paid for in the endometrial biopsy. So, you know, not the patient doesn't go away or you, you're not losing an IVF cycle. Like a consolation and prize. so it became, it became very popular. Right. Um, I had my suspicions because most people, and if you're familiar with the ERA, you can either be pre-receptive or post-receptive, meaning that your progesterone has to be started earlier or later. Right. But the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of ERA tests are pre-receptive, okay. which means like almost everybody's pre-receptive. And, and this, you know, bias of being pre-receptive also doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, like, you know, because first of all, if that was the case, just give people more progesterone. What are we doing? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so I think that that, that's what it comes down to when it came to that. Uh, and it's true, actually, the person who developed the ERA that was, you know, Dr. Pellissier in, in Spain, he's the one, and he's a very honest guy. He, he, you know, kept on doing the research, and he's the one himself who published the data about the fact that ERA is not as reliable as it is. So, you know, he's a very, a very honest uh, sort of like doctor and approach to medicine that he had. Right. So, you know, it wasn't about the patent. It was that the doctors did more studies, but it's still popular. People still use it. Yeah. Not to the I, same degree, but people use it a lot. Would you say, I mean, at least from um, the patients that I'm seeing on a regular basis, they're mm -hmm. doing more modified natural transfers, natural transfers, um, at least in Toronto. And mm -hmm. I mean, that works out in terms of because the ERA essentially, in order mm -hmm. to do a mock cycle, they'd have to be on a medicated transfer. Like you couldn't mm -hmm. do a modified natural. Um, no. So knowing that the modified natural has potentially a, a higher success rate, it would sort of eliminate the need for the ERA. Would you say that that's what you found or? No, I think for people who. First of all, it's not really clear that modified natural is better right. than, than medicated. 
people don't really know that factually. But, you know, what happens is the same problem that we talked about before. The people who see you probably have failed already. They're seeking new answers. And the doctors have really nothing to offer. And so they say, well, you know, that transfer didn't work. What are you going to do different? You can't, you know, the, the patient demands change. The patient will not accept keep on doing the same thing over and over again. You know, and, and I'm not saying they're wrong in that, but, you know, that's yeah. really what happens. So the doctor's like, well, let me offer you the modified natural. It's like a different way of doing it. It's also appealing because, of course, it's uh, quote unquote natural. And uh, and so there you have it. Now, do I disagree with the modifier, mod- modified natural transfer? No, I don't disagree at all. I think it's a very good way to do it. And I do think, think that individual patients may do better, especially the ones who don't respond very well to estrogens right. and their lining doesn't grow. So there's definitely a benefit there. Yeah. Uh, but it's just like, honestly, it's like hit or miss. It's part of a process of trial and error, which is completely random. It's not, it's not like the, in IVF, it's not like the doctor's design these treatments based on you know scientific evidence or based on your labs or whatever your characteristics are as a patient and they'll do whatever protocol according to that. No, it's completely by the seat of their pants. They start with something which is the most common thing that they do. Right. And then if that doesn't work, they'll do something different. So that's really what it is. You know, like it's really very unscientific. The problem with the scientific approach, which is what's happening now, is that it's uh, a little bit dehumanizing because what happens now that um, IVF centers are being bought out by big companies, private equity, and so you have these mega conglomerates of IVF centers, they are trying to be more scientific, actually. They're trying to be more standardized in in the way they do stuff. So that means that sort of everybody gets the same thing and there's no room for for change because they're just collecting data. Right. So if you go there and, you know, ask for a change or ask for something that's a little bit different than the standard, they're not going to give it to you. And uh, they can't understand um, why the doctor is refusing sort of like a different approach. Yeah. Um. And second, because they're frustrated by doing the same things. But the centers, the IVF centers are collecting data. And uh, there's going to be a benefit, I think, in the long term, because if you have like literally tens of thousands of people going through procedures in a very standardized fashion, I think you're going to, at some point when you put all that data together, you'll be able to analyze and you'll be able to make something out of it, which I think it will be helpful. But right now, basically, if we're going through IVF today, we're basically, you know, lab rats, you know, like, and I'm not saying Super. this in a negative way, you know, but basically you're just going through the system, you know. When they're collecting data, are they doing it based off of more than just, you know, patients' levels? Are they looking at lifestyle at all? Or is it just no. interesting? Well, they, they're collecting a lot of information, right? You know, whenever you look at, at, you know, I'm sure that you've looked at those cycle sheets. Yeah. There's an enormous amount of information in those cycle sheets. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that when a doctor is just looking at that with their own eyes, there could be like, you know, 50 data points, 100 data points that you cannot, the human mind is not able to analyze and interpret those data and make decisions based on that. Right. So what happens is that you you have to uh, remember that these this data collected is going nowhere right now. But once they're able to actually you know struct and they will, then you'll have a little bit more information and and you know and everything else will count. And you know are they collecting lifestyle data? I don't know. Probably not. Right. I mean you know I think the closest thing they get to lifestyle is they measure your BMI. Right. And that pretty much sums it up. And, and check if you're a smoker, which is a very rare thing anyway. I don't know who else who smokes at this day and age, but I that's that's lifestyle for you. I don't think any sort of like specific dietary or anything more deep is actually studied or collected. Right. I have a lot of smokers. It's oh, but they're but it's male factor. 
and they won't right. stop. It's no. interesting because <laughs> most studies on smoking, I don't think it shows that it affects sperm quality, the studies on smoking. It affects it DNA wrong. frag. Oh, really? I, is that what it is? Yes. I'm obsessed with sperm. Don't take that the wrong way. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's I, I don't understand how, you know, you have your partner who's willing to make all of these changes, who is now undergoing IVF, who is, has potentially have had to have surgery. And then you, you can't even stick on a Nicorette patch or pop some, some gum. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I can't, I but I, I like that you thought that they were extinct. I like that. That's <laughs> I, I just don't see them. I don't see anybody who smokes in my practice. I don't see a single person. I feel very like strange. you've a very motivated patient base. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. They're they're all out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you're very sick or you're significantly infertile, you've done a lot of you know either you have pain with endometriosis. Yes. Obviously, one would do anything to make that go away. So people are willing to go to extraordinary lengths to you know ameliorate their problem to solve their problem yes so maybe that's also one of the reasons what do you think about um endometriosis affecting protocol um in terms of ivf protocol do you think it's relevant or not i think it's relevant the problem is another issue is that the data on endometriosis that was collected over the years is very confusing right? Because if you look at the data, endometriosis uh, does not really affect significantly on a, you know, on a per cycle basis of EF outcome. Right. So, you know, uh, the answer to that uh, confusing finding is that most of the studies were, you know, did not really properly identify it or they were biases in the designing of the studies. Right. So, regard, you know, and ultimately, it's very hard to measure uh, anything that has purely an incremental impact on an outcome. Okay. Because you know, if it's something that's a hundred percent or zero, okay, then you know, if you do that, then that doesn't happen, or that happens, so then it's easier. But let's even say that endometriosis reduced the success rate of pregnancy by fifty percent. You right. know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, which that would mean that, like, you know, 50% still get pregnant, right? Yeah. And and so you're going to have a situation where, you know, there is this bias where people with endometriosis are still getting pregnant, although in lesser numbers, but this may not be so apparent because there's different stages of endometriosis. Yeah. There's different, uh, um, you know, different people with different problems. So. You know, whenever you have any activity that impacts in a uh, incremental way or a decremental way, it's very hard to study. Mm-hmm. This is why this is the reason why most nutrition studies suck, because you know, like you can't really, you know, it's very hard to prove stuff that has purely an incremental benefit, right? Yes. So you know, and so like you know, whenever and that applies to almost you know a lot of things that we do. So that's the problem with endometriosis. And because of that, doctors who do IVF uh, have concluded that IVF bypasses endometriosis. And so they, they use specifically this term. And then you're left with people who just don't get pregnant because of endometriosis. And uh, and these are the people that fall through the cracks and ultimately they get frustrated and end up seeing doctors like me. Um, having said, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not that I'm not knocking IVF. IVF is, IVF is a fabulous treatment. Yeah. And and you should do IVF if you think that you have fertility people out there. You know, you know, you have fertility issues. It's fine. But if things don't work, I just am not convinced that the brute force method, which is keep on trying, is actually the solution. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I don't think by any means that you come off even in, in your social as a physician who's anti IVF. I think it's more oh, oh. that you see it as a tool and you understand the need to identify what patients it's appropriate for as opposed to just right. blanket giving it to everybody. Because 
you know, I'm sure you have a lot of endo patients where, you know, their fallopian tubes have been compromised due to endo and IVF right. is then a godsend. So right. Right. you can't just say IVF is, you know, inappropriate as a medical treatment. That'd be insane. My, my philosophy ultimately is that people have to be goal driven, objective driven. Yes. yes. Uh, and enter the process with an open mind and try to figure out, you know, what works in instead of like allowing anything else bias their judgment. People though mm -hmm. sometimes are very much uh, experiential in their approach to health. Yeah. Like in the sense that they like to do it their own way. And sometimes that gets into the way, right? You have the hyper-technological person that walks in there and, and they do like five IDF retrievals. Boom, 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 and nothing happens. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're like, yeah. I'm very practical. What's What do we do? Let's go. Yeah. And then on the other side, you have people who are like, no, I'm never going to do it because, you know, I don't like to do stuff, put stuff in my body, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with either of these two approaches. You know, you one should live their life the way they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is that, you know, these all these sort of like, cultural biases end up interfering with the process in the end. Yeah, I definitely, I have a lot of patients that come in saying, you know, I'm going to do IVF because I'm this personality type as opposed to because I require it. So I think, right. yeah, it's interesting that that's sort of across the board. Do you think endometriosis and autoimmune disease are a cofactor scenario, or do you mostly think of endometriosis as predominantly like just a a reproductive disorder that's made worse by you know excess estrogen? The immune system, you know, plays a role in everything, right? You know, if you're looking at all the progress that been that's been done in cancer therapy is coming from the immune system, yeah, and. Uh, the, our knowledge in the immune system and immune mediator medication. So there's no question that the immune system is everything, you know, and when it comes to endometriosis, it's an inflammatory condition. So if your body's fighting a battle there, you know, it can't, the body can only, and I'm speaking in a metaphorical way, but, you know, I think we understand each other. Mm -hmm. um, the body cannot fight five battles at the same time. Right, you know, you can only fucking fight one battle. You know, it's almost like the troops. You can only fight a battle on one front, two fronts, but you can't fight a, a war on three fronts or a war on four fronts, because then you're going to lose the war. And I think that's what happens with the body. Right. When the body is fighting a war on multiple fronts, the body collapses and loses. So you know, this happens with endometriosis, where endometriosis because it's inflammatory, your body's fighting that. And on top of that, you add the stresses, the physical, emotional uh, stresses of doing an IVF treatment, or you add, you know, any other condition on top of that, then things are going to get worse. So if you have endometriosis and on top of that, for example, you have a history of thyroid disease, right. then things are going to get worse. Uh, it's interesting because uh, um, uh, Jesse Pazzini that I just mentioned from the, the Pazzinis, the, that couple that they're online, mm -hmm. uh, they're influencers. And, and she was, I was talking to her and she was telling me that she had this, she had a little bit of endometriosis, but not very s symptomatic. And then she had like a thyroid storm, like severe thyroiditis, you know, uh, hyperthyroidism. Mm -hmm. And um, she had, because of a, you know, toxic goiter, and she ended up having to have surgery, a thyroidectomy. Um, and by the way, I'm not her doctor. She told me the story. So, you know, I'm allowed, you know, and we yeah. discussed it on. And she she said that she had a thyroidectomy. And after she had a thyroidectomy, shortly after, the endometriosis ramped up. And she was like, and I thought that there was a connection there, but the doctors told me no. And I'm like, of course. What happened is that you had this major thyroid problem. Mm -hmm. You had an operation. Your body's like, you know, fighting, a, you know, a battle here with the healing and everything else. And, you know, like it's got to give up somewhere else. And that's where the endo comes up. So we always have to think of things in those terms, you know, where. And that's what really the immune system is. That's what immunology is all about.
Yeah. And that's why you see this association with many autoimmune conditions, especially gut related, but, you know, ulcerative colitis, yeah. uh, Crohn's disease, you know, certainly association with endometriosis long term. Yeah. This may exist also because people take birth control pills and taking birth control pills is associated with inflammatory bowel disease. We don't right. know what long term assumption, but right. You know, everything, everything messes with the immune system. In terms of when you're doing transfer protocols for an endometriosis patient, are you mm -hmm. taking the immune system then into consideration? To some, you know, the answer is yes. Okay. And I think people with endometriosis always ask me about the transfer protocol. Yes. And, uh, you know, we also have to remember, though, what works in terms of lining, right? Yeah. Because, you know, you're not, you could try to do a modified natural, but then maybe you don't build up lining. What are you going to do? You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes when you're doing a transfer, you need to compromise. Right. And uh, so it's not said that you just go and you do like a high, you know, like a, some sort of a heavy duty protocol with lots of estrogen, the estrogen, whatever. But the reality is that if you're not building up lining, sometimes you need the estrogen and that's what it is. So I don't necessarily knock, you know, non-natural protocols, medicated protocols, unless, I mean, there's a specific reason because I know that sometimes you need to do what you need to do in yeah. order to get a good transfer. Right. The other thing that I always, that happens to me is that I try as a consultant for patients not to interfere too much with the doctors. Right. Because what happens with these fertility doctors is that um, they they are used to do things their own way. Yeah. And they know their protocols. And if you start telling them do something completely different, maybe they're not prepared for it. Um and they don't know how to manage it properly. So I, I kind of allow the doctors to do their thing, to be honest with you. Right. Also, you don't want to alienate the doctor because then the doctor sort of like detaches themselves emotionally from you. Right. And then what happens is that if the doctor detaches emotionally, then you, you don't, you know, you kind of energetically speaking, and I'm talking like a, a guru now, but I think that you create this negative energy and things don't, you know, may not work out as well if the doctor sort of gives up emotionally on you, you know? That's interesting. That I have a lot of patients who are so stressed about frustrating their doctor for probably that reason, but then you're sort of, your hands are tied because you're then completely at the mercy of, of your physician. What, yeah. do, like, what do you do then? Bring flowers. Well, I feel that, you know, when it comes to... Um, I feel that for certain things, you don't need to convert your physician, right? You know, like you could do your thing. If the doctor doesn't need to know about it, why do you have to go there and tell them? You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, let's say the doctor doesn't quote unquote believe in acupuncture, whatever that may be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, why, why do you need to go and tell the doctor? But, I, you, know, you know, just do your thing. You know, like, you know, I, I don't think that it's particularly helpful to engage in an academic discussion with, with the doctor. Um, I mean more less about alternative health or things that you could do for yourself, but more about you know the nitty gritties of their protocol. It's tough. It's tough. I mean, you know, you need to find a doctor that is on the same wavelength with you. Okay. You know. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, they're going to do it reluctantly, and uh, you know, it's it just it's just not going to fly well. Bad vibes. Um, and you know, this is why there's a lot of doctors. You know, like I think that that's just the reality of what it is. I mean, some doctors have, have a more open mind; other doctors are more like sort of strict. That's their personality, and that works for some people, by the way. Yeah. Some people don't like. Do not like uh, relativism. They like to hear things are a certain way, and that's how we do it, and, and that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, it's very hard to change people's minds. Yeah. You know, you're not going to change a, a, a doctor's mind. You know, they they are set in their ways, and if you don't, if they don't, if they don't fit what you're looking for. Just get another doctor. Why do you have to convert these people? I think people are stressed I just don't see about. It. The process of having, you know, people get very attached to the fact that they've started something somewhere and they don't want to switch because they don't want to do additional new testing 
or meet new people and and i i understand oh, no, completely but at the same time it's it is tr- i do hope because it is interesting if you see you know a patient who clearly would do better at a different clinic with a different doctor um they do have better success when they're more aligned but it's tricky because you are typically referred by your family physician who is then going to refer you to who they're most familiar with as opposed to you know in a concierge service where they're looking at you as a human and then determining when you, know, you have endometriosis and I know that this REI has an interest in that or you have what I think is PCOS and I've had a, you know success with patients who have gone to this clinic. Instead, it's yeah. like everybody's going to the same clinic and getting the same protocols and it's... Yeah, and also sometimes people live in small places where they don't have a lot of options. I mean, yeah. of course, Toronto has a lot of options, You're but right. yeah. um, like you know, maritimes. sometimes people live in an area where, like, you'll have a doctor who's the only game in town, and yeah. uh, and then um, they have no choice, and they they certainly don't want to alienate that doctor, you know, but. Yeah. Look, it happens to everybody. You can't please everybody. I also understand that as a physician. Sometimes people don't like me. Hard to believe. I don't believe it. But they, do, they don't. Uh, or they don't connect. You know, like it's completely 100% understandable. And uh, that's just like life. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing that you could do about that. You know, sometimes chemically you don't connect with people. And that makes it a little bit, you know, different. And I think... When it comes to surgery, you know, the surgeon obviously is a technician. So you you wanna you wanna have a good surgeon, which is important. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe it's a little bit easier with that because you don't really have to talk to them a lot, you know. Yeah. But when it comes to fertility, where you have this sort of like daily interaction that could last for months, if not years, unfortunately. You know, why the heck would you want to be with somebody that you don't like or that doesn't see it, that you don't see eye to eye with? What's the point? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've gotten to ask you all these technical questions that yeah. I was very excited to ask. I feel very privileged. Um, I'm going to ask you one more technical question, and then I would like to know what you do for fun. But first, mm-hmm. <laughs> but first, what are your thoughts on intralipids i'm curious i don't think they do anything you don't think you're not a fan no okay mostly because um when i measured you know i mean i can't you know when i look at the measurements when we looked at on our patients what happens to when you basically get an infusion of intralipids you have a very transient change if almost nothing right in the ratios, you know, of, uh, you know, omega-3, omega-6s and all sort of like that inflammatory profile. Okay. And we really saw like a blimp, you know, it was like almost nothing, a blip, you know, a blip on the radar screen, which makes sense because it's a brief infusion, the last 15 minutes, and then you're done. Right. Um, and it's a small, it's almost like drinking a glass of milk. You know what I'm saying? You know, a fatty or a cream, if you will. And I'm, I have. A difficult time believing that having a glass of milk is going to, you know, drastically make an impact the long term. Right. Um, that's why I usually recommend that people take oral um, fish oil supplements. Right. Okay. Great. Um, be- which is the same as intralipids, but you take it every day, twice a day for a long time. So you basically have a better effect on on your inflammatory profile, right? right? Um, so yeah, basically, I I don't use infralipids, and I, we haven't used it for years. Okay. Um, the reason why intralipids were introduced, you know, like you know, the background of intralipids is that they were used uh, originally uh, when people are in the hospital. Either they had trauma or they have like uh, they can't eat because they had big surgeries and whatnot. Right. They give people what's called parental nutrition, which is like the IV inside your arm, and they feed you with uh, an IV. Yes. And those are intralipids. Only that the bottles are. If you have ever been in a hospital, you've seen people on intralipids. The bottles are enormous. They're like five liters, 
and yeah. you and you get the infusion over time throughout the whole day. Right. As a patient. Right. <clears throat> and and when they looked at people in trauma units and intensive care units, and they saw that when they were getting this total parenteral nutrition, TPN it's called, mm-hmm. um, they did better. They, their inflammatory parameters were lower. Right. But that's it because they were getting a 24-hour infusion day after day after day, right? Right. So, you know, somebody thought, hey, maybe we could just give it a little bit, you know, and, and that's going to work. And it showed that if you gave that little infusion, you have a transient change in the levels of immune of natural killer cells. Yes. And uh, and I'm like, so what? I mean, like, so you change it that NK cells for like a, an hour? Like, what's that going to do? Right. And so I, that's why I don't use intralipids. So I don't I don't prescribe them. I don't use them. But. You know, if people want to do it, I'm not going to say don't do it. I mean, it's not going to do it. You know, it's not going to harm you. It may harm you financially, I guess, because you have to pay for it. But yes. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people, like, if you want an immune treatment, you know, that actually has been proven to work, you have to use either prednisone or intravenous immunoglobulins, IVIG. Right. But this is gold. Which is, you know, more invasive, more side effects, more right. problems. More money. Um, Are there side and, effects uh, for prednisone with? Oh man, major. The, but with the the fetus, or is it just the, no. the with the um, the carrier? No, no. There, there's there's there was some early data that shows that there's a slightly increased risk of cleft palate. Okay. But you know, other studies that it hasn't really panned out. So. And especially when it's given in the very early phases of the pregnancy, it's really not an issue. Okay. Yeah. After 20 yeah. weeks, after 20 weeks, maybe, but in the first few weeks, I really don't see it. The, right. The evidence that that's the case. Yeah. And I, I don't think, I only have patients that I think are taking it for 10 days, like five pre transfer. 10 days is too short. After. Yeah. 10 days is too short. Right. Yeah. The, you know, you got to keep on taking it to prevent the loss. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, I got to ask you all of the questions that I think other people will find relevant. But now I want to mm-hmm. ask you questions that I that I just want to know because I'm just a nosy sure. person, you know? Hit me. What do you do for fun? Good question. What is fun? Define fun. I don't know. You know, do you look, do surgeries I... for fun? You're like today. Oh. I'm yeah, getting... for me, surgery is probably the most fun thing that I do. I have to say, I love what I do. You know what? I love it I when really you pull enjoy... an appendix, like an, an endo appendix. My fave. Yeah. I can't yeah, wait. I, I have to say, I have to say that um, I really enjoy. Uh, you know, and it's kind of funny. I sound like a workaholic, which I am, but um, I do. I really enjoy my work, and I, working with your hands is a wonderful thing because you. You have fun, you know, like I like what I do, you know, I enjoy it a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, having said that, I've always uh, you know, I I love I love to travel. Okay. Uh, and I do travel quite a bit. I like to kite surf, which is a sport that I do uh, you know, with a kite, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, I know. Um I used to be more fanatical about it. I'm a little bit less fanatical about it now, but I still I still love it very, very much. Still love it very, very much. Right. Um, so you know, those are you know, that's one thing that I really like to do. Um, you're traveling, you're and, kite surfing. Uh, I'm kind of like you know, I'm kind of like a family guy. I love my kids. I spend a lot of time with my kids. To be honest with you, how many kids do you uh, have? I have, I have? I have five kids. Oh, God, I have six kids. Mm-hmm. Look at us go. Wow. Five, yes. So I, I love my children, and you know. That's one of the things that I really do for fun, I have to say. I really enjoy it. And I have older kids and younger kids, but I just love spending time with them, you know? Yeah, that's lovely. Um, it's kind of a boring answer, but no, you know, it's just the reality. You know? I think that's a great answer. Do you I any... wish I could tell you I love riding motorcycles, which I do. Right. And I do ride motorcycles and I love it. But, you know, somehow when you ask me that, it, it's not the first thing to came to which came to mind. So I guess I don't like 
riding motorcycles as much anymore. You know, it it also <laughs> frightens me slightly that you are two hobbies are kite surfing and motorcycle riding because we need you Mm -hmm. to stay alive and to have good (laughs) use of your hands so that frightens me a little and what are what are your hobbies what 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 are your hobbies i just i run i do podcasting anything really to avoid spending time with my children (laughs) okay good idea (laughs) stay away you know it's safe that's very nice that's very nice no it's they're very cute. Yeah. They're um they're psychotic. They yeah. keep me on my, on my toes. Thank That's you. Incredible. This was a tremendous opportunity. I I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, but I'm just so so it grateful. It was a great conversation, very stimulating. Um, you know, let's do it again. I think that, you know, we okay. went deep in a few in a few questions. It was really, really good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I hope uh, your followers will, you know, find it helpful at least a little bit. They're going to freak out. Uh, Ultimately, the take-home points is keep an open mind, I think. You know, that's really what it is, you know? And find the right physician for for you. Correct. Yes. And, uh, you know, I'm actually, you know, opening a center in Mexico now. Wow. uh, Because of cost, you know, a lot of people are going to the States and also to me, but... I found a place in Mexico, which is a top-notch hospital where we'll be able to do a lot of things. So it's going to be very good. So stay stay tuned for something pretty exciting. You you know, kn- you know that I will. Us. I'm I will. I'm picturing you with like kite surfing in between patients now in Mexico. Yeah, that would be pretty good. That would be pretty good. But stay safe. Well, great. I even put my new glasses on for you. You see, like you know, my new. They do. Um, they look very vogue. Awesome. Yeah, it look it looks like I'm going. You know, my wife said it looks like I'm going uh, scuba diving with these glasses, but still, <laughs> no, it's pure fashion. And as you can tell right, from my right. attire, I'm clearly very fashion minded. Yeah. <laughs> again, it was a pleasure, and uh, let's talk soon again. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.